words about the BBL, uh, the Bundesvereinigung Logistics, uh, Federal Association Logistics in Germany, for which I have the honor to speak today in my function at the heat of the chapter Russia of uh, the BBL. BBL is a great uh, platform with uh, 11,000 members, a unique network, bringing together specialists and leading figures uh, from the worlds of business, science and politics. And that's very important in um, this uh, field. Uh, for example, the Caspian region, I think it's uh, very important to promote it and uh, such huge platforms like BBL gives a possibility to promote, uh, to contact um, uh, interesting partners, clients and so on. We do this since uh, 1978, so for over 40 years and um, um, very a challenge is to importance the logistics and the supply chain management uh, that is uh, one of our uh, main uh, aims which we have. We are a non-profit um, and um, we promote the exchange of knowledge and experience uh, not only in Germany but uh, also outside of Germany with 11 BBL chapters and 14 representatives all over the world. One is Amir in the Iran and uh, for me as a chapter in Russia and that gives also very good opportunities uh, to uh, contact and communicate with uh, friends in so many different countries in the world to have their partners uh, for beginning or establishing business. And in Russia we established this in 2011. Why I am um, here uh, very interested in the region of uh, Astrakhan. Um, that's uh, my uh, group of companies, LUNO, since 1992. And uh, we are um, promoting and managing projects um, even in the logistics sector. And one of our projects since one and a half years now, that is uh, the port uh, of Astrakhan, the construction of a new port, new terminals there in the Astrakhan region. And um, therefore, Frank, a little bit more, uh, will tell you uh, after me. So um, this um, is now the beginning, the Russian president uh, Vladimir Putin um, last year on the 7th of May um, he uh, announced that Russia wants to become an important logistics hub between Europe and Asia. I think he um, understands that logistics is not only necessary for trade but it's a huge impact for economy. Um, it's uh, more than 30 percent uh, share of uh, business uh, uh, calculations and uh, of course you can do the year a very good business uh, too. Therefore you need uh, of course uh, good framework conditions and uh, good infrastructure and um, that he appointed um, to all the ministers uh, and uh, huge companies. I want uh, to be a leader in this way. Uh, Russia have to be a leader in this way and uh, even the Caspian region of course is one of these. So Russia of course uh, it's a very great location between Europe and Asia and it has access to a certain seas, have a very powerful railway, um, um, quite good port infrastructure um, but um, uh, on all the way you see um, the logistics performance index um, we will make a benchmark with 160 countries and there uh, Russia uh, is not so good, so quite uh, bad logistics performance index, uh, but there was a, a, um, the uh, numbers of 2018, so the 2020 logistics performance index is still not published um, due to the um, pandemic and um, uh, I think uh, Russia may be uh, better, uh, I think so. Uh, and be sure. Uh, but um, in the old uh, performance index, uh, all the major emerging countries such as China, Brazil and India are better placed and even Kazakhstan and Ukraine uh, are ahead of Russia in the ranking and uh, that uh, shows us uh, Russia has to do something. So the um, number one in this logistics index for the third time already Germany and uh, Russia is only on the 75th uh, place. Um, and um, when you see the components uh, of the uh, logistics performance index, customs, infrastructure, uh, the arrangement, shipping, logistics, quality, timeliness, tracking, tracing, 
that has all um, uh, come into a score and uh, this score of course Russia has to do something and even uh, the two um, um, necessary uh, steps uh, the framework to optimize the framework conditions and uh, the infrastructure I think uh, here it is um, necessary uh, to develop and linking the existing corridors the international transport corridors um, here we have uh, three of them who go through Russia the international north south transport corridor that's uh, more my field in the last one and a half years um, the new Silk Road uh, from uh, China to um, uh, Europe and uh, the Trans-Caspian International Transport Route uh, goes uh, um, uh, out of Russia uh, from uh, China uh, to Europe and uh, we are uh, very actively working in this uh, field in which way we can develop them and link, uh, even link them. So if you have here the first International North-South Transport Corridor 20 years ago established, uh, but not uh, at least uh, in this uh, important uh, ranking for corridors because it goes through the Iran, uh, Iran that sanctions, uh, so many forwarders um, uh, still not so interesting to use it. Uh, uh, if you see the, the advantages, uh, when you see the standard route uh, through the Suez Canal, and uh, this uh, you have only the half way and uh, two and a half times quick, more quicker uh, or two times and a little bit more. And that's of course uh, very good advantages even in this times of e-commerce when you have uh, uh, to, you need uh, to uh, offer quick uh, transport and logistic ways. Uh, but uh, the Iran, uh, it is um, still now a big problem even for our forwarders. So uh, what we do uh, uh, after we get the mandate to, uh, to develop um, the um, port in Astrakhan and um, uh, additional, the International North South Transport Corridor, we established a working group and international invited uh, not only Russians, but uh, delegates from India, from Kazakhstan, uh, from uh, Belarus, uh, so you see here, uh, Hargos, uh, the port, uh, the port of um, um, Bronka, uh, the general director, he is the uh, main investor for the port of Astrakhan, uh, the CEO of uh, the uh, special economic zone in the Astrakhan region. And uh, we um, did not only invite uh, specialists in logistics, but also the traders, because we need, uh, of course, uh, uh, amounts of commodities. And uh, here you see on the right side, the CEO of the Unex company, for example, it's uh, one of the um, bigger dealers for grains and, and uh, vegetable oils. And uh, of course, it's uh, very necessary when we speak about uh, future uh, transport uh, options, uh, we need to speak uh, from the beginning with uh, those uh, who use uh, our um, uh, ways and our corridors. It was uh, very successfully uh, established in September uh, 2019 in St. Petersburg. Uh, in the last year, we had two um, online um, meetings and um, what we what were the results? Um, so you see here the the old corridor from uh, St. Petersburg uh, through the Caspian Sea, through the Iran, uh, directly to India. Uh, we first uh, offered to extend the uh, international transport corridors to the two parts of uh, Germany here, the huge ports Rostock and uh, Hamburg, uh, because uh, they are also looking for new uh, opportunities, for new challenges and for new ways uh, where the goods uh, from China can go uh, again um, the other way to uh, to Russia you know, or to Central Europe and uh, that was the first challenge to uh, integrate them. Uh, they did it with pleasure uh, so uh, you see here uh, if you have a Rostock uh, with 25.1 uh, 25 million tons of cargo handling and um, Hamburg with uh, 136.6 uh, um, million uh, and uh, containers uh, for 9.3 million. Um, from them, I think 600,000 uh, goes now to uh, Russia. Uh, so, uh, very interesting clients um, for the International Transport uh, Corridor. And um, I'm very happy 
at the end of last year, the Port of Hamburg the first time pronounced the International North-South Transport Corridor and this presentations and uh, you see uh, Ingo Igloff, uh, the CEO of Port Hamburg Marketing and uh, here you see uh, Dr. Tesch, uh, the CEO from Port Rostock, who is also very interested in um, uh, into participation uh, for these uh, new uh, transport uh, corridors and um, Rostock more for the general cargo, heavyweight, uh, and, and uh, um, the um, bulk, and uh, Hamburg more for the containers. So that was a uh, um, very uh, huge success. Uh, you see here Astrakhan and the port and the uh, Caspian region directly in the center. Uh, that is not my slide, that's a slide uh, from uh, Port of Hamburg. Um, second, uh, what we um, suggested to integrate um, or to pronounce more the Volga, so the river transport, the multimodality, and the very interesting um, export potential export volume from Russian uh, producers. Um, I think 40% of the industrial production from Russia is there in this um, area from the Volga uh, region. And um, if we integrate this, of course, we have. Um, uh, new uh, export volume, uh, which we can transport uh, not only over the INSTC, but also uh, to the middle corridor. And uh, therefore, we have a possibility uh, to um, make um, this Caspian region like a logistics hub. Of course, the third uh, was here the um, railway to Poland. Uh, that's a very typical way which we can, which we have to use uh, additional uh, and um, uh, we do it. And uh, the repositioning, that was the third main idea and recommendation from us, not to show till now uh, and this time uh, to the Iran and India, but more use the possibility from the INSTC to um, position the Caspian region like a logistics hub for the very interesting new markets from Central Asia and the whole Caspian region. And uh, that uh, was um, the main uh, advantage uh, where the forwarders and the expeditors and the logistics companies uh, started to hear about these possibilities um, and um, that uh, we will you know, do in the future, uh, even with the new Caspi port, um, there is established a uh, port special economic zone already inside the Caspian cluster. Uh, there, uh, nearby the old port Olya, uh, 660 hectares um, a place. And the last uh, November on the 7th, uh, the um, um, Russian um, administration registered uh, this port special economic zone. Um, and uh, gave free their um, quite interesting investment uh, to establish there the infrastructure outside of these new terminals uh, from the uh, Port and Logistics Corporation. Um, that is uh, also a very interesting project, but uh, there you get more information from Frank Busse after me. So, um, what we are uh, thinking about the other uh, corridors like the new Silk Road, you see uh, the established uh, ways uh, they are going not uh, through this uh, Caspian region, um, the main uh, road uh, that's here uh, in this way. And if you see uh, that is one of the results of the pandemic in the last year, uh, the um, container handling over this uh, doubled in the, the last year, so the huge uh, um, request for this um, um, for this way, for this new way, where you can send uh, goods uh, from China to Europe and uh, in the other uh, way direction uh, very quick, 15-20 uh, days, and um, um, for a ship you need uh, the double time. So uh, that is uh, very interesting and our idea of course is to um, uh, connect here the Caspian region uh, together with the uh, International North-South Transport Corridor and uh, maybe also here to the uh, Central uh, Middle Corridor uh, where we positioning here the region 
not only um, for splitting the, um, um, the containers uh, or the, the volume of, of the, uh, the railways, but also um, uh, consolidating here uh, block trains and um, going uh, in the other direction here to the north uh, and maybe then here to the south. Therefore, we are in negotiations uh, with uh, all the committees uh, from um, the um, One Belt One Road Initiative and uh, hopefully uh, we um, have some results in uh, the second half of, of this year. Also, if you see the Trans-Caspian International Transport Route, uh, they have also huge success um, and um, not doubled, but I think 70 or 60 percent more uh, volume uh, in the last year. Um, and um, I hope that we um, continue our negotiations here to link uh, the two corridors, the INSTC with uh, the middle corridor. Uh, to um, transport not only in this way uh, to Central Europe, but also in this direction to Northern uh, Europe and Germany. And um, um, I'm very positive that we um, have, um, when we uh, further um, speaking, like in this uh, conferences, uh, that we have um, platforms where we can speak about this, not to be like competitors, but more for partners uh, who link the corridors and offer their very good um, um, logistic uh, possibilities uh, for the forwarders. So uh, that is uh, one more idea from us to uh, market the region, um, to become more logistics um, in the Caspian region, uh, like the Caspian logistics, uh, like a consortium um, only for positioning the Caspian region, like a dynamic um, region with a high growth potential, uh, even like the logistics hub for connecting the transport corridors, uh, like a gateway between uh, Europe and Asia and the key to the Central Asian states. And if you see the Germans and Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan is one of the uh, um, uh, most marketed uh, regions in the, uh, or countries um, here in embassy from Uzbekistan who works, uh, make great work. Um, and uh, if I see our financial institutes, uh, they are very open for financing investment projects in um, Uzbekistan. So I think uh, there we will have a huge um, um, request for, for more uh, transport and logistics in this, not only there in Kazakhstan and uh, Tajikistan and other states, of course, too. Um, therefore, we need even such uh, Caspian Europe for us to come together and to speak about new projects. So we have to develop uh, transport solutions um, with lucrative offers, with special tariffs. Um, and um, therefore, uh, of course, we need um, uh, to um, work uh, such in the beginning with uh, the states, uh, with uh, um, all the ministries uh, who uh, can give us uh, special tariffs um, for market uh, our new and um, maybe better uh, transport solutions. So uh, what we are doing in our next steps uh, on the 25th of March, we have the next working group session for development of the INSTC. If everyone you're interested, um, you're welcome. Um, we have a um, Russian-German logistics forum in April in Moscow um, via the Trans-Russia. Um, unfortunately, I think without any international participation, therefore we have to do it in online, but uh, the last uh, forum, um, it was um, very interesting and um, hopefully we can there again speak about the Caspian region. Um, in August, uh, where we the second uh, Caspian Economic Forum, the first was in uh, Azerbaijan, uh, I think, or yeah, I think in Azerbaijan or in Turkmenistan. Uh, second now is in uh, Moscow in the 11th and 12th of August, very uh, interesting. The TransTech International Transport Corridors Forum in St. Petersburg, uh, there we have a panel uh, from the BBL uh, to promote even this way of uh, Caspian uh, Sea and uh, the Middle Corridor and uh, the INSTC and the Caspian Europe Forum we already uh, heard about and uh, our uh, huge conference from the BBL 
in its um, October 20s until the 22nd. Normally over 3,000 uh, of participants. Uh, I don't know um, what will be in this year in October, but hopefully we can uh, meet there. So that's from my side. Um, welcome to the Caspian region, I can say. It's uh, very interesting for us and the BBL um, will support um, all the initiatives of this, um, the chapter Russia, uh, we are very open for cooperation and uh, ready at any time uh, for your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mirko, um, the, 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 for the great presentation. Um, <clears throat> you have shown us, you showed us um, very clearly how these uh, projects, how these uh, logistic projects and these international corridors are located and are developing. Um, and you showed also very interestingly how they could or they are planning to be connected like the middle corridor with the, the north-south corridor with and also with the belt, belt and road initiative um, and you said it yourself that it's very important actually also for uh, for more cooperation uh, instead of competition how did you see until now in, in all these meetings you had, uh, steering committees and also uh, these working groups, the cooperation between the countries, between the involving uh, countries and, and um, yeah, and what could be more, uh, um, um, what could be more progressed in a way uh, that it, the, the, your work as, as a logistic company would be easier? Hmm. So first of all, I think um, we have to speak. Uh, when we don't speak, uh, we cannot um, uh, offer new logistic solutions. I think uh, all forwarders and logistic companies uh, are very open for new, uh, interesting, uh, good tariffs, good uh, solutions where we can transport uh, cheaper, uh, faster, uh, quicker and uh, without uh, so many risks, uh, without so many borders and um, if we are looking in the landscape, uh, for exact, uh, example, the middle corridor, you have uh, quite a lot of borders, uh, quite a lot of administrations. And uh, in, in the other uh, direction, when we uh, linking it, uh, you have uh, um, not so many borders. No? Even if you see the Eurasian uh, um, economic um, uh, initiative where we can with the uh, economic zone from Lisbon to Vladivostok. So we have Kazakhstan and uh, the um, uh, Russia, the Euro-Asian Euro economic union yeah, uh, together with Belarus. So I think we have to connect, we have to offer and we have to speak. Uh, I think competition is, the, is uh, any time a result when we don't speak together. And we um, said we have to um, we have to um, work together uh, to establish new ways. Um, and uh, the Caspian region, uh, like a zone, it is not so um, well known. And now, no? there we have to um, um, use uh, each possibility uh, to show it in a better way. And I think uh, that is um, maybe um, possible when such uh, companies uh, like um, Hamburg Port Consult or uh, our company, any other from outside of these countries uh, come and link them together at any mm -hmm. time. So you have yes. uh, in this way um, a sparing. Um, maybe that is one of our uh, uh, challenges in the future. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, you, you, um, Mirko, uh, this explain to us how about a very interesting um, logistic project, international logistic projects, and also a very interesting international corridors and the Caspian region in, in the heart, in the middle of all these um, uh, co corridors and projects. Well, for as we talk about the biggest sea, inland sea of the world uh, in, in the middle of this region, um, the necessity of ports and um, good infrastructure at, at these ports are very important and as i said um, we uh, all these uh, all of these countries are investing as much as they can uh, in new ports in developing new ports and, and expanding their infrastructure 
um, we have the port of Baku, for example, as, as the biggest port in, in, uh, at the Caspian Sea. Um, they have also the new port, the international uh, sea trade port of Baku is becoming the largest transportation and logistics center in the Caspian region with uh, almost, I think, uh, above 20 million, uh, the capacity of processing 20 million tons of goods. Um, and we have Turkmenistan who, who invested uh, $1.5 billion in expanding and building a new port at Turkmenbashi, which was opened in 2018, and also Kazakhstan with uh, Aktau, and also a, a, a newer uh, port of uh, Kurik, and uh, also Iran is playing, on, um, in spite of all the sanctions, uh, is uh, building new ports at the south of the Caspian Sea as 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 we heard uh, from Mirko, um, and also Russia. And I'm happy to have Frank Busse with us now from uh, Hamburg uh, Ports Consult. They did the pre-feasibility study for the Caspi port in the Astrakhan region in Russia. And the ver we see, as we see, um, a very beautiful picture, uh, I think, I, because I read uh, I heard that the problem with the rush the, the ports in um, in uh, the Caspian Sea in Russia is that they freeze in winter, if I'm right. And um, I'm looking forward to your presentation, how the Russians with this new port are maybe not only solving this problem, but also maybe other solutions. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I hope you see my presentation now and you hear me clearly. Um, uh, yes, we did this research and this pre-feasibility study on the Caspi port, which is very much integrated in this network, which has been uh, described by Mirko in the previous um, presentation. So, um, yeah, the more you get up the Volga, the more uh, trouble you have with the ice. So we are quite close to the Caspian Sea still, so it's kind of manageable, but um, we there are challenges. The picture you see here is, is the Volga at the place of the first development stage of this new Caspi port. Um, it is an existing key wall. You will, I will talk about this later. And um, so we have been there. And um, as Mirko said, uh, this was our last trip, my last business trip actually, uh, before the pandemic starts. Um, and we were there in February 2020 with a whole team in Astrakhan region and Moscow to research on that. In the very first step, just a very few words on HPC, Hamburg Port Consulting. Why have we been engaged or assigned for this um, for this opportunity and for this project? Of course, our name says Port Consulting, so doing a pre-feasibility market research on a, a potential port location and port project uh, sounds quite reasonable. We are uh, working as management consultants and software solution providers for port and transportation. So there is port in the in our name, but it's actually all over the transportation chain. And we also have some a small group of airport as specialists in our team. So we take it quite serious with the ports and we we handle inland ports and dry ports and all these things. So we are located in Hamburg and uh, we are in the market for almost uh, 45 years and we are working with 100 specialists full-time on these issues. Um, we have been in 120 countries and uh, we have six own software solutions that we provide for this, uh, for the transport and port industry. We also have developed and operated an own container terminal in the Ukraine, which we shifted after 10 years of operation to our mother company, which is the HHLA, the Hamburg Port and Logistics Company, which is the largest terminal operator in Hamburg. 
and one of the largest in Europe. And so this underpins again our view on the projects and is coming always from the operator view. So we are no civil, con civil construction company that really wants to build huge terminals. We also look for a suitable solution, for a reasonable solution saying, okay, what is really needed and what is needed when. So we have phasings and all this as the challenge always is in port development, you have this massive investment in infrastructure and you have this infrastructure there that, and you don't build it, you can't build it for five years, but you will build it for 40 or 50 years, whatever. And having this heavy infrastructure and this decision on it and these investments you have to decide and be, but being flexible on the other side, that is all, always the challenge. And you will see later that also uh, the Caspi port will be developed and our suggestion is and recommendation is to develop it in different phases. So, but that's that's to HPC. Um, so how we work, we work on the pre-feasibility study of the Astrahan port, Caspi port which is the dock and logistics complex Caspi in the Astrahan region. That is the name. The investor is the port and logistics company, company Caspi LLC. And we call it the facilitator is the special economic zone around it. I will show you later on a slide what this is about. So there, the, um, the uh, really um, opportunity, the great opportunity we have in this region is that we we have a combination of these kind of public special economic zone project and these investor that wants to invest in a port and the, the, the special economic zone that needs a port and the special economic zone that in the end generates cargo for the port. And so you have a, yeah, a cooperation there, which is quite unique from the very beginning. And so this it was really a pleasure working on this and uh, planning this. And uh, it was also um, great cooperation with the Luno Group. Who, and uh, you see here on our picture where we signed our contract and um, and you see, of course, on the right side, the location of Astrakhan, but my colleagues already explained this to you, which is great. Okay, um, we, Mirko already said, we had this um, start of this project and we went there with a the whole team and uh, which is very important for a project like this. We have seen a lot of corridors, a lot of economic developments uh, in the region. We have learned today how, how countries develop, how regions develop, what are their um, focuses, what are the industries. And this is, if you're working on a study like this, it's, it's not only macroeconomic, but you have to really have to dive into the market. And this is what we have done with the whole team. And this is just to give you an impression and we have been on site, of course, on the site for the new port. We we have been there with the investor. You see on the left picture above, there is a was a huge interest of public media in interviewing the investor, saying, "Okay, what is what is the aim? What is why are you here? What are your plans?" and um, and we have been there. We have talked to uh, market experts. We have talked to the administration. We have talked to government. We have talked to banks. And and uh, this is important to get a real deep dive and a real realistic idea what is going on. And when we started this discussion last year in February, I sometimes heard that, oh yeah, Astrahan sounds interesting, Port of Olya, Caspian Sea, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's not really on the transport landscape, on the transport map currently. But after 12 months and also of course of these uh, tremendous work the Luno Group and BVL is doing on promoting this region and the corridors uh, is really that this uh, location now has a, is a spot on the transport and logistic map. And, and we had this discussion one year ago with, with Russian companies saying, okay, yeah, of course we know where it is, but 
uh, it's not a, a place for container operation or whatever. This has really, really changed over the year. In the last 12 months, with all these initiatives, with all this project marketing, with all this discussion, as Mirko says, involving the people, talking to each other, and um, even competition, I will come later to that, is very interesting in this region, and it's very interesting how the stakeholders are dealing with this. So, giving you an impression, what what did we figure out? So, is really we have you see on the left side the map. So we have the Astrahan region. You see this this gray big um, blue arrow here, which is the um, international north south transport corridor, and uh, which really connects and is an essential trigger or driver for volume development of Astrahan and the Port Caspi. And, uh, and then you have this distribution, which also goes a little bit to the west. You see here, but the major regions, the major directions are uh, on the um, eastern side of the Caspian Sea, southern side, as we have seen in the previous uh, presentation. So one of the very interesting discussion we had was, okay, it's not only it's it's not only a port where we where we uh, um, uh, route cargo through, but we have a hub, and this is why we we call it a hub, and this is the name of the presentation today. The, we have a hub here at the Caspian Sea, distributing or giving the chance or the opportunity to distribute from here cargo uh, in this region. Sorry. Um, we looked on very different cargo types and commodities. We, of course, looked on container, which is um, for this area something new. So you see, I've I show you some years only. So we made this forecast for the next 30 years saying, okay, we have this huge investment. What could it be? What could the development be like? And uh, we will start in the fourth quarter of 2023. This is the plan with a, with a smaller volume, but it's only just one, one quarter of the year. And then it develops really dynamically. And if you, and this is always the point in logistics, uh, from my experience over the last 23 years, if you offer, you have to offer infrastructure and services first before cargo will flow. So nobody will book something because you tell him, I will have a port here in th three years. Why should anybody book something? But um, um, if you have something in, the, in place, if you have an infrastructure, then we are very sure that the development of the volumes is very dynamically. And so, and, the, and we show, and we see this here in the container development um, growing up to more than 200,000 um, TEUs, uh, or if we have, and that is very down here, we have uh, more than four, much more than 400,000 TEUs in a high case calculation. So we consider different cases, and uh, we have a base case, and I show here the high case. And um, so just to give you an impression, what we figured out in all these interviews, of course, considering Mark economic factors that we have heard in the uh, very first um, presentation today. So, and then we looked on different cargo types, project cargo, which is sometimes somehow related also to, to um, uh, certain industries and even the, the construction of the special economic zone around this port will have a, yeah, a, a temporary impact impact on the on the volumes handled here. We talk about wood, which is a, a commodity already established in the region. Iron and steel, sulfur, fertilizer, grain. So we have a lot of dry bulk here. We have liquid bulk here. We have offshore supply for the oil and gas industry, and and so some. So looking on this, diving in these in these markets, we. Um, we uh, come up to uh, more than 14, 14 million tons in the last year of the projection phase, and we start with, with almost one million tons here. And um, 
So to give you an impression in what regions and what dimensions uh, uh, we are thinking and what we do expect and and that we really need good intermodal and uh, connections for this location here. So this, wa this was a little bit on the volumes. So it's about these 200 to 450,000 TEUs that we expect there. It's about these 14 million tons of cargo we expect there. And as I said, we there is this opportunity to build the port and there is the special economic zone, which is under planning, which where the funds are now um, approved and which really has a drive and is developing. So, and uh, you see all these colored uh, uh, areas here, which are the uh, special economic zone. And we have, and the special economic zone needs and wants a seaport, huge port, and this is the the new port that I will show you in a couple of minutes, it's, it's in this region. And the very unique opportunity that we really have at this location here is that, as we have seen on the very first slide, we already have two berths and an area of up to 40 hectares here in the back. And uh, we have this two berths, which really, which has to be uh, refitted a little bit and work worked on and the area has to be um, developed and prepared um, but we already have something there this is the reason why we can start so early saying okay we have february 2000, um, uh, 2021 now and we will start in 23 with port operations this is why because we already have this births this two berths here and this will be the very first start and we will start here with um, uh, certain commodities and certain services and when two years later the new port will start some of the cargo will be moved and other services will stay here so and which is really great and which is and all these developments of the special economic zone and the port has really the backing of the admin, local administration on the Russian government. And so, um, yeah, everything, that the package is great and promising. And um, this is just to give you an idea, we have seen it uh, on the very first slide, but this is the birth here. These are the two births. This, this is the key wall. This here is the existing port of Olya. So it's, um, for all the port experts, um, this is um, having a capacity of around 4 million tons currently. Um, um, and so very, very close to the, or right adjacent to this existing port, there will be this econo special economic zone and also the first stage of the development of Port Caspi at these berths here. So, and there is a little bit more ice than on my, uh, on my uh, slide. Um, but still manageable. So. so when we talk about a very first stage and when we looked at the volumes that we expected in the, in the first two years, or, um, let's say 2023 20, and then 24 and 25, and at the end of 25, we will start with the second stage, which is the new port. So having this in mind, we said, okay, we have to develop this area here. We have some mobile cranes here. We have a very flexible uh, um, area to be used for container handling, storage, for project cargo handling and storage, probably other commodities that will be there. We have the opportunity to build warehouses. We would recommend probably if everything develops like as we forecast it, to have three of this, but let's start with one. And so I didn't show, I, I do not show here the phasing, but also here we have a flexibility saying, okay, how does the market really develop? We have an area here for silos where we store grain and where we store vegetable oil. We have rail connections with us, which is important rail for uh, project cargo and containers, rail for bulk cargo, knowing that in the very first phase, 
probably the the transport will be more on the truck side so also this has to be established it's not only the port and its services also the hinterland transportation and the services have to be established and this is again so important that uh, Around these projects, there are these um, um, initiatives for the corridors, and then there is political support, and so that that we are uh, uh, striking together, but working, uh, walking apart. So, so we work for the same aim, but there are different impacts, and there are different factors that has to be um, considered. So, rail transport has to be developed. A uh, truck will be, uh, we assume that truck will be more in the beginning. And even here, we have a lot of um, possibilities to extend, to expand um, the, the area for storage if we figure out that containers stay longer in the port than expected, if we have a change in commodity mix, if we have new businesses coming up saying, okay, uh, there is a kind of factory that will be built in the special economic zone and we need all the parts for this plant or this factory um, to be uh, uh, routed through this terminal because everything will come by a um, vessel or something like that, and or the 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 development, the growth of of the commodities is stronger or larger uh, than expected. Then we are very very flexible here in this side to ex extend and expand the the area that we can use. We have a a, a gate area here for truck parking, truck administration. And so actually the typical components you need for a terminal. So we do have here the key wall, the storage area, the rail connection, the truck connection, and the area for value added services. Is it only storage in the warehouse or is it more? So this as a very, this as an idea how to start uh, in, in, 23 with this project and with the port operations in Port Caspi. Then at the end of 2025, we start to develop, uh, we start to operate, not to develop, we start to operate with a new port, which is the stage two within these huge port development project. Um, where we have this designated area you see here in orange uh, uh, something and and you see the green and blue which is the water area or the potential uh, basin of the of the port area so it's a huge area which is wonderful so you see that in the very first phase of this stage two we uh, we do not need the whole space we, so and this is again i'm showing you here the first phase of stage two um, of the new port and then we have th three more development phases to show you how we would recommend or we how we are recommending to develop this facility here and then it's it's not that compact of course as uh, on the first um, terminal part which we have seen in the previous slide but the, here we really have a general cargo area we really have a bulk area and we have a container area and we have always we will always see in our maps here the area for the high case what we really need more we have the high case considered for the containers then and we need again rail connections and we need again truck connections um, so um, interesting it what we have chosen for the bulk operation grain or liquid we have chosen not to place all the vessels in line at a berth at a key wall a key wall but on a jetty so where we have we save some space here for the of key wall and we have this jetty here and as we have space in our basin here we can use this jetty having then uh, using two berths at this jetty in the beginning only. Then the second phase, which will be ready in 2030, then you really see a real uh, expansion of the general cargo, an expansion of bulk and um, 
and also containers. So um, this is due to the development of the volumes that we have seen in the, in the table some slides uh, before. And uh, you see here, we, we need a third berth for the bulk and we need some more berths for general cargo. And then it's really how how are you, we calculating this? You you uh, you we know from all the projects or port projects that we have realized during the last 40 years, 45 years, um, how much how long will it take to operate such a vessel? How long? How much um, dwell and um, idle time we need and on these berths you know, to change the vessels uh, and so on and so on and this will come all into a operational model that we have and then we calculate all these uh, things that we need like uh, on the size of each area is really um, impacted by the dwell time of how long will the cargo stay in the port is a general cargo is a project cargo that may be rest for half a year there because you will bring it there with a vessel and then you build something and you get it piece by piece so then you need a larger area if everything is uh, stored only on a short basis then you um, need a uh, smaller space okay the um, next development phase with it, which will start uh, operating uh, op operations eight years later in 38, then we have a development really in containers and in bulk. So less in general cargo, but uh, we need one more berth for the bulk operations. You always see that also the basin is expanding and that the, the uh, dredging material that we get out of the basin uh, will be used for land reclamation and stabil stabilizing the, the land in this area. And the, the fourth and last development stage will be then uh, nine years later in uh, um, 2047, where we really have then uh, 24 hectares general cargo area, 3.3 uh, hectares bulk area with silos and all this. And we have this container area of 14.4 hectares, um, or as you see, uh, almost uh, not, not doubled, but more in uh, for the high case. Yeah? And for the high case, if you need more storage area, then you need more berth and you need a larger basin. And and in the end, we still have reserves. That is also great. So this is then it's a final phase of development re, um, cons, um, um, related to our projection phase. So um, but then there are still opportunities, and then there is still flexi flexibility. And if general cargo uh, does develop. Uh, double as we expected, then we really have opportunities there to handle this. So great location in, in various aspects due to uh, this corridor issue, due to um, the uh, support we have uh, on administration level, due to this special economic zone, and due to the interest of the stakeholders around and so on. So it's, it's really a very, very promising um project and location so um so and then finally just giving you an impression so um the caspian basin is uh is more on the lower part when it comes to russian throughput a seaport throughput so and uh, when we talk about the Caspian Basin, Russian on the Russian side, let, just for the example here, 2.8 um, uh, million tons there, and we have in our um, um, forecast 4.5 4 million for grain. So we really, this is really a driver. This is really a driver for the Russian seaport throughput for the Russian cargo handling development um, in total or also in total. So, and then some last words from my side on the um, issue of competition. Um, these are all the ports that we considered in our study saying okay these are existing ports these are ports which have kind of 
comparable uh, commodity and cargo structure. Um, and uh, we analyzed, we looked, and and what we really um, experienced is that we have great discussion with the with the representative of Turkmenbashi, for example, who see the a new port opportunity in Russia as as an opportunity, as a chance, saying, okay, if there is one more original destination of cargo, it it does mean uh, uh, there is there are more opportunities for us to receive or to deliver cargo, and um, this was a very nice experience and a very nice um, yeah it's reflecting the mindset. So of course everybody is there to do business and to earn money, which is totally clear. But having a mindset saying okay yeah why not seeing this as an opportunity and how can I um, yeah, we discussed them in the very early phase of this study, and we discussed and said, okay, how do we expect that? And and also what we experienced then is on the southern part, Anzali, Nash, uh, Nasha, and all these ports and the south, there they um, they are not really a competitor, but um, also seeing these opportunities, if there are more ports in the north, we have more origins and destinations for our cargo. And what is also important to, for developing a port is how are these ports equipped? What cranes do they have? What berth do they have? What draft or uh, what depth do they offer actually? So that this has to fit as this is a kind of, it's not a microcosmos, but it's a, an own cosmos, this Caspian Sea here. And so we we have to adjust capacities and, and equipment and so, so it has to fit together, otherwise you build something which is not reasonable. And so and having this is uh, was a nice experience for us being so long in the market saying, okay, um, we have different ports here, but most of them really see this as a an opportunity. And when it comes to the Russian port, like Olya, even Olya and Astrakhan, where we have also discussions, they they could think, okay, ooh, a third port location, a third strong port location in our comparatively small region. Who? What is that? This is more competition. But we have good discussion, and everybody. Uh, is seeing it as an opportunity and really sees that in, that a, a project like this with all this support can really draw volume to this region. And as you see, uh, I always say, if you have one bakery somewhere and you put a second beside there, so both are making their business. So, and if you have one port there and if they are somehow complementary, so if they all three, Astrahan, Olya and um, Kaspi will do the very same, that could be kind of challenging, but if they see uh, themselves as complementary ports, then this is great. And if you look on the right side um, on our graph here, it just shows what we really expect uh, for Port Caspi. If you see Port Caspi very below there, we we mentioned this, the, the expected throughput for the years in, 15 years and in 30 years compared to the current capacity it's not about the throughput of each of these port but the the published and announced uh, capacity of these ports we are really thinking about a huge port there um, competing or being comparable to Aktau, Turkmenbashi and Baku today which are huge ports in this region and then actually I would uh, close. So these are, uh, I hope you got an idea of what we are doing there and what we are uh, developing. And I hope you share the idea and the spirit uh, that this Caspi port is a promising project. And um, yeah, thanks for listening and uh, looking forward to your questions now or afterwards. Thanks, thanks, Frank. Um, very interesting uh, and informative, actually, <clears throat> presentation and uh, uh, of this topic. And it's uh, your closed 
topic. So the, the last uh, topic you said subject is a perfect um, bridge to Daniel's presentation, Daniel's topic. Daniel Cruz um, is a senior advisor at OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. OSCE has um, a very, is running a very interesting project um, in Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and um, Kazakhstan about the connectivity. Frank mentioned the importance of, of uh, connectivity and cooperation between these ports. Um, and this project of OSCE is about more digitalization of, of the services and connectivity and also sustainability at these three ports, as I understand, but more uh, on Daniel to explain to us about uh, this very interesting project. Please, Daniel. Thank you very much. And I would also like to thank the organizers once again for bringing uh, together a community of experts interested in the Caspian region. And I think uh, from what I've heard, I can say that we are all united by one goal, uh, to get more cargo volume uh, on this region, to promote the region and to allow it to live up to its full potential. And it's something that we uh, completely subscribe to. And uh, I also like Mr. Buss's presentation and projection that wasn't only for a decade, but for many, many years until 2050, I think you were modeling your trade statistics. And uh, what I'm about to tell you is also a, a project that is very, very much forward looking. Um, so uh, let me begin, um, sorry, here my screen, um, with um, uh, introducing you to a vision that we have um, in our project uh, for the region. So I think it's quite fitting. We heard a little bit more about the north-south connectivity through the Caspian. Now I'm going to talk about east west west east and what we would like to uh, help to bring to the region is digital green and inclusive connectivity um, and uh, you can see here uh, we did a mapping of uh, current uh, trade corridors uh, projects that are in the making some of them quite successful some of them have fallen a little bit asleep um, and uh, you can see here on the right the current countries that are part of the project. Uh, we started in the Caspian Sea with Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan. But we have now expanded uh, the project actually uh, in the west to the Black Sea, Georgia, and then actually Romania, and all the way into Central Asia so that we can include Uzbekistan and Kyrgyz Republic as well. Uh, you can see here um, the ports, dry ports and seaports that are involved in the project. Uh, and um, so together with our partners, and I'll get to that uh, in more detail, we are developing a digital and, and uh, green trade agenda for the region. Um, and because uh, um, this uh, event today is also about COVID and about um, what the post-COVID-19 trading world will likely look like. Uh, I've brought with me today, to get, uh, today a slide that is looking at some of the mega trends that are likely to transform uh, logistics uh, for the coming decades. This is here uh, by the World Economic Forum. And I just want to mention a few, uh, and that underlines the importance of our project. So, we have to uh, rebuild supply chains to be more resilient. We have to build strong community to help each other out and diversify supply chain in uh, times of supply shocks. We have to um, create equal opportunities so that everyone can participate in that growth in the region for coming decades. We have to think about a green agenda, about decarbonization, a definite megatrend on the horizon that will not go away. And we have to think about what we can do to make this region attractive, not only through building new ports, but to upgrade existing infrastructure to increase the quality in terms of digital processes, streamlining uh, the um, time and the processes that cargo takes at different uh, points in the logistics chain. So these are core topics um, that uh, we are working on. 
And um, so we have uh, established this project that we also refer to as the digital route project. And just to outline here uh, a couple of benefits, uh, how it can help us to uh, rebuild these supply chains to be greener, uh, more secure, um, to bring more simplicity, certainty, speed, and safety to uh, these routes. Because as we have heard today, um, the location is fantastic, but we are facing what we call multi-country, multi-modal transport risks. So we um, cannot actually utilize the full potential at the moment because we have very lengthy procedures uh, at borders. Uh, we have unnecessary wait times at ports. Uh, we cannot at the moment do pre-arrival clearance of vessels in the Caspian Sea traveling from Kazakhstan uh, to uh, Azerbaijan, for instance. And these are topics that uh, we need to address. And um, as I told you, we have three components of this project, one looking at connectivity, one looking at greening, and one looking at also advancing opportunities for women. Uh, no one can afford to leave women out and nowadays uh, uh, in the workforce. So we are focusing on these three pillars. And uh, the centerpiece uh, of our work that I wanna talk about a little bit today is the what we call the common digital platform. So um, as you can imagine, um, ports in the region and trade stakeholders, they all uh, have are very hungry uh, to streamline their processes through digitalization. We have lots of paper-based archaic processes still in place. We don't have in all places harmonized data that we can exchange. So um, we looked at different places around the world and uh, how it's done there. We worked with leading uh, suppliers of these type of platforms from big port locations around the globe. And we have done a in-depth assessment in the ports of Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan on how we could actually uh, create a common platform that everyone can connect to and that can actually uh, put everyone together uh, to share data and to exchange data and to really um, make uh, take advantage of the significant time, cost, and security uh, potential that we see uh, in this platform. So as I uh, told you, um, so we've done in-depth workshops at these ports. We have actually modeled the cargo throughputs also for the next 20, 30 years in different scenarios. We've built a revenue and business model uh, for this platform, uh, how it should be owned, how the data should be managed, etc. cetera. And uh, this is actually um, a great piece of work that uh, will inform governments in the future to make a purchasing decision. And uh, um, so um, anyone interested uh, in this work, uh, we can uh, gladly uh, supply more information to. Um, and uh, one thing that I want to emphasize, uh, because also uh, the previous uh, discussant uh, told uh, us about the importance of cooperation and cooperation, uh, we found it exactly to be the same. Um, because uh, only if we have really everyone involved in the platform end to end, uh, can the platform actually uh, utilize its full potential. So this is a, a very important message. And so I'm very happy that uh, we have the opportunity uh, today uh, to discuss that. Next to the digital platform, uh, we also uh, conduct uh, activities in those ports to assess their digital readiness. So um, do they have the right ICT infrastructure? What is the state of digitalization in their processes, in their workflow? Uh, what kind of uh, data formats actually do they use to exchange data? Um, so we're working on that. And also uh, during this year, uh, we are prototyping first digital data exchange to the Caspian. So we're working with the port of um, Baku and Aktau on an XML-based exchange of the first uh, layer of data. Uh, the same we're doing between um, Turkmenistan, port of Turkmenbashi and Baku for a carbamide shipment. So, and we will evaluate um, uh, these uh, prototypes. 
We're also um, working with uh, our Kazakh friends on a blockchain-based prototype that they're implementing for first data exchange. And um, so in this year, it's going to be very exciting to see the first uh, fruits of that labor and uh, uh, how that actually works in practice. Next to the uh, connectivity work stream, let me briefly also introduce the green work stream. Uh, and uh, I just want to say um, that uh, we are seeing a big uh, shift actually also in the region from, uh, uh, you know, it used to be something uh, green uh, that, you know, um, CEO says, why should I pay money for that? Uh, operations are running smoothly uh, anyways. But now we're seeing gradually a shift where I'm um, actually um, being sustainable and uh, having a concept to um, save CO2 is actually more and more becoming a component of core competitiveness and of your brand positioning. So increasingly, um, customers are asking for that. Uh, big customers like IKEA, for instance, uh, they want to know exactly how the carbon footprint is. Um, not having a sustainability concept, an environmental management concept can increase your uh, financing costs with international banks and so forth. So um, we believe this is something uh, that is increasingly understood. And so in this component of our work, um, we're working with ports to introduce environmental management certificates. Um, we're looking at uh, how to integrate renewable and um, energy efficiency, fantastic conditions in the Caspian, uh, as you well know. Uh, we're looking at how to decarbonize actually uh, supply chains and alternative fuels, how to implement them. And as I said, I mean, these are all topics that are very future oriented, uh, but I'm convinced that uh, they will grow in importance. And uh, so I think it's very timely that we work on them. Just to give you a little success story. So uh, now currently we're implementing with the port of Aktau, the first ever Ecoports uh, certification in Kazakhstan. Uh, that is certified by Lloyd's, working with a leading uh, Dutch consultancy on that, uh, introducing that in the port. And uh, uh, we believe that the port of Kurik in uh, Kazakhstan will be next. And also we have had strong interest from uh, Georgian ports. So uh, I think uh, uh, this is a very promising uh, area uh, of work. Um, also, uh, we're very happy, of course, uh, to hear uh, that representatives from ports and the trade unions and uh, logistics operators are present. We are looking forward, once COVID allows it again, to um, bring the best of green ports in Europe uh, to the region. Uh, as you can see here on the map, uh, we're uh, planning to visit the port of Hamburg. Actually, that was uh, already organized, but COVID destroyed those plans. Uh, we will visit Rotterdam and Antwerp, uh, Valencia, who has a very interesting uh, green port concept and digital uh, exchange, uh, Port of Trieste, etc. So um, I think this is a, a very good uh, way of sharing knowledge between port managers from the region, um, environmental engineers, uh, IT department heads uh, with uh, those best practices in Europe. And uh, maybe just to... Um, tell you a little bit of uh, the experience of uh, of the platform uh, and the feasibility and and uh, current plans to realize it i mean it's an incredibly complex topic um and uh, we believe that you have to uh, actually segment uh, that uh, uh, platform into a b2b b2g component g2g component and that you have to build it incrementally I mean, just to give you an example, um, in ASEAN, uh, they did a similar exercise and it took them 10 years. <laughs> so uh, this is not a small project and uh, it takes a lot of uh, um, uh, enthusiasm and stamina, but uh, uh, we have a very uh, promising uh, first prototype for the B2B part uh, that actually will go live soon. It's called LogAware and already some companies registered there. It has a track and trace and booking function and so, uh, if you're interested, please uh, let us know and uh, we will introduce you to the platform and you can tell us about your user experience. That would be fantastic. Uh, that's only one example. Um, so um, that's uh, on, on that topic. 
And I've talked uh, already a lot about um, how we discuss these topics and how we work through the different uh, agenda items. And for that, we have um, created something I think that's unique in the region. Um, and that is uh, what we call the Digital Route Working Group. Uh, it has a green component, it has a digital component, and um, uh, it unites uh, uh, leading organizations from rail, shipping, customs, governments, freight forwarding, diff different levels of logistics um, from the region and from Europe. And um, we have um, uh, every uh, second month a meeting and um, here's just some um, some recent topics that we uh, um, discussed and uh, that are on the agenda. The next one we will have uh, will be in the end of March and it will also include uh, alternative fuels. We did a study of the potential for the region and maybe also already include first insights from the digital uh, trial of the uh, Kazakh uh, um, blockchain-based solution. Uh, if you're interested, then uh, please get in touch with us. Uh, yeah, and uh, as you can see here, um, we have talked to everyone, uh, mostly everyone who is uh, active. Uh, and uh, so we um, fully embrace uh, partnerships between the public and private sector um, to push this uh, project forward. Um, and uh, here you can see just a uh, breakdown of the participants and where they're from. We also have strong interests from Turkey. They're not officially part of uh, the project, but they uh, have expressed interest in uh, joining the working group. So. Uh, if you are a member of a, ben a beneficiary country, please approach us and we can tell you more. And uh, once again, uh, anyone who's interested, uh, uh, we will be very happy to provide more information. We also believe that uh, this huge uh, uh, and ambitious plan uh, can only be done uh, uh, cooperating with all of you. And um, finally, uh, let me also mention here some um, activities that we've planned uh, for 2021. So uh, we're going to uh, work on the implementation of echo ports for Poti and Batumi. Um, we'll send a regional mentoring program up for women in energy and logistics. We'll carry out feasibility studies for renewables, do the prototyping, um, and continue to strengthen uh, the digital Silk Route community. Um, and that uh, um, brings me to the end of my uh, short presentation. Uh, here, once again, you have a summary of the project, which now runs until 2023. And uh, once again, if you are interested in more information, please be in touch with me and my team in Vienna and uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for this very interesting project uh, int and introducing it to us. There is one question, uh, maybe to you or Mirko, I don't know. Um, the, um, and the question is about how important the Caspian Sea is for the sea itself is for the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and is the cooperation cooperation going well between um, the literal states and and um, China and uh, and how the the last question of this colleague how politicized is the cooperation in in this framework of the Belt and Road Initiative? Daniel, maybe with you or oh, I, I think uh, Mr. Novak is a better uh, position okay. to answer that than me. <laughs> Mirko. So uh, we started uh, in this way more. Forward us uh, like DB Cargo um, who, or uh, UTRK or the Russian Railway uh, who uh, are um, in front uh, of the ordering, in front of the transportation, so the cargo volume. Um, they are still now more interesting for us. In the whole project uh, of the transport corridor and, uh, and the Caspi port, from the beginning it was uh, very important for us not only to get um, political uh, support, but also speak with potential clients uh, from the beginning uh, to uh, get an impression about the real 
cargo volumes. So we can speak like uh, the Kazakhstan, um, I hear it in, in the uh, press uh, that uh, the um, Ministry of Transport, I think, from Kazakhstan uh, estimate the double of cargo volume uh, in um, the Aktau and uh, Kurik uh, until 25th. I don't know exactly in which way uh, they want uh, to double uh, the volume uh, from today, but uh, that is a more political, um, I think, um, meaning. We try to, to speak uh, directly uh, with the people who uh, has the possibility to generate cargo volumes to the Caspian Sea. And they need from us special offers, special prices, special tariffs, special possibilities to consolidate, to get more volume maybe outside from the Caspian region. Um, or from uh, a nearby, as I saw, told you about the Russian export center who support uh, very intensive but now Russian exporters. And I think it will be increase the cargo volume, not only uh, in the transport corridors, but also in the Caspian region. You know, if I uh, see the agricultural um, export from Russia, now uh, it is uh, developing uh, very increasingly and uh, of course many goods go from Russia uh, to the Caspian region, uh, to uh, Central Asia, uh, to Iran and so on. So uh, for us it's necessary to speak with uh, the people who have uh, the cargo volume potential in their the hand and uh, they ask from us concrete offers. Thank you, maybe, thank you very much. Maybe I can. Maybe yes. I can just add to that. <laughs> Sorry. So um, we believe that uh, you know a diversification is something very very good. Yeah. So whether it's pipelines or uh, trade corridors, uh, the more the merrier. Okay. Um, but what I think is important is uh, if we look, um, you know, as this top at this topic of IT platform and digital connectivity, what is important for everyone is that we have standards that are compatible also to European standards and that uh, whatever platform uh, actually evolves remains an open platform for everyone to join. Because uh, if you look at this platform space, there's actually internationally a big battle going on of systems. Yeah, whether it's a Chinese system, an American system, a European system, whatever. Um, what's important is that everyone can use it similar to a utility, if you will, yeah. Uh, decentralized control, if you will, in a consortium. Uh, so that's very important for uh, supply chain uh, security. Mm -hmm. and yeah, may I, add, may yes. I add once two sentences? Of course. Yes. Um, so to the question, is the Caspian Sea region important for the Silk Road? I would definitely say yes. And the other way around. So the Silk Road is also important for the Caspian Sea region. So there's a clear yes, because it's uh, we we should always see it as a network. As we have seen on the slides today, it's a network. And it's not just from Wuhan to Hamburg or Dusseldorf, the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. It's a network. Mm -hmm. And we need something in between to have a sustainable network in the end. And political interest, yes or no. Currently, there are subsidies for this transport. Okay, that is clear, but we all always need this to establish some something and um, to establish infrastructure and connection. So, but we see over the years in the development, how, market, how markets develop and uh, how we even have cargo from Europe to Asia with this, comparable uh, comparatively high price compared to the vessel we have cargo that we transport via rail to asia and we need all the spots all these terminals all these um, countries in between that uses the train keep it simple that passes it's uh, it should not pass it should stop take something from astrakhan to hamburg and from astrakhan to wuhan or whatever just to have a picture in mind mm -hmm. Um, to sum up um, this very interesting discussion, thank you again uh, for your uh, presentations. Um, we have had a very, I think, clear and good picture of, um, of the region, the recent developments in the infrastructure in, in the, uh, at the ports, 
we learned that uh, transport is very important for for the countries it has a huge potential in order to diversify their economy and um, we have learned that all of these international corridors um, are some actually interdependent uh, work as a network um, and there should be more cooperation and the, sh um, the interest and the goal of all the countries uh, in the region and also around is to develop and to increase the transit through this region uh, because of many reasons. I think, I hope I could uh, put it in a nutshell, uh, this two, the, the, the two hours discussion. As we said, um, we are uh, planning the second Caspian Europe Forum at 5th and 6th October. Um, hopefully also uh, with a, like last year, um, with a physical event in Berlin. Uh, hopefully we have a situation in October that we are allowed to see each other in person. Um, and um, the topics are, like, like last year will be energy, like now logistics and infrastructure, sustainability. But this year we have added uh, also uh, um, the, the finance sector into the, because of it's very important, and also the um, tourism um, uh, subject. At the end, I'm happy to introduce also very shortly, because we are ending uh, at the end of our time, uh, Mr. Hasanov, Zaur Hasanov, the head of international cooperation at the Baku International Sea Trade Port. Mr. Hasanov, you're um, yes. very welcome to, to our discussion um, group. Thanks, Amir Bey. I hope you hear me. It's a very unusual day for Baku, because we have five uh, centimeters of snow, so everyone at home. Oh. <laughs> City pretty much locked, but uh, uh, but it's a pleasure to see you, Amir and Daniel, uh, as usual, for promoting Porto Baku and our uh, our plans and intentions. We have been working with OAC for a quite long time and quite efficiently. I'm going to talk less than five minutes, uh, but the key point which I would like to under uh, underline that it's a great momentum for the Caucasus because after the, the war. Uh, which lasted for 44 days when the, we uh, pretty much defeated Armenians. But it's not about whether who defeated whom. It's about new opportunities in the region. And you know, one of the points of the agreement which Azerbaijan uh, has reached with Armenia with the support of Russia that uh, new communications lines are going to be open. And uh, very recently, President himself uh, went to Fizuli district, which used to be the front line, and he opened inaugurated the construction of new railway uh, road up to Armenian border and I'm hearing that on side of Turkey they are also building or thinking of building uh, 160 kilometers long railway system railways uh, from Kars to Nakhchivan so definitely it's going to expand uh, the opportunities for the region and it's going to reduce the risk of new wars uh, but in terms of logistics, new roads is always good. I think it's going to have an impact on the uh, east-west uh, direction and north-south uh, um, uh, international transport networks. So we have a very great expectations for coming years. Regarding the port, I, I can say that we had really good numbers in 2020 uh, in spite of uh, COVID uh, problems. Uh, overall turnover of the port increased 20% by 20%. And uh, for example, um, truck uh, discharging increased uh, uh, quite substantially, reaching 43,000 trucks, over 40,000 containers. I know it's the, in, in terms of numbers, they're not as big as we would like it to be. But if you compare with 2015, for example, the number of containers discharged at the port of Baku increased three times. Uh, number of trucks increased five times. Dry cargo increased 3.5 times. So um, all combined uh, with, with what I have said regarding the new developments after the war in Nagorno-Karabakh going to give us very promising future. And I hope that uh, we'll, we'll all enjoy uh, from these perspectives. Thanks. Thank you, thank you Zaur. As, um, as Baku is, uh, as I said, uh, the biggest port uh, at the Caspian Sea and plays a very vital role as well in the north-south 
axis as well as uh, also in the east-west axis. Uh, happy, uh, thank you again to all our experts and to all our attendees. Um, as, we, as I said, uh, um, please stay in touch with us. We are planning to extend and to more uh, develop this platform, Caspian Europe Forum also into um, an association here in Frankfurt in Germany and uh, um, our planned conference the second Caspian Europe Forum is, as I said, at uh, 5th and 6th October in Berlin. Thank you very much again to all of you for your attention. Uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Have a good one. Spasiba. <laughs> Have a good one. <laughs>